I was, I was diagnosed at the age of 11 months with an incurable cancer of the central nervous system called neuroblastoma stage four. Uh, the doctors told my family that there was no chance of survival to, to take me home and allow me to live the next few months. Um, but like we all have, we all have choices and the choices that my family made, in particular my mum, she chose to ask one question that was, I don't wanna know what the chances are my son dying is, I just wanna know what the chances are of my son surviving. And, the doctor gave me a 96% death rate. They said, you know, don't, don't put your boy through this sort of pain. But I'm just so grateful every day that she chose to look at my life being not 96% empty, but she chose to look at it being 4% full. What happened? Because you, you were really impacted by something very dramatic at a very young age. There was a uh, trial drug that they were trialing on 25 patients around the world. They had 24 candidates and uh, they asked me whether I wanted to be number 25. And my family obviously said yes. We had no idea what the side effects would be, but we started the drug um, with 24 other families and within one day we were all transferred from the oncology ward to the burns unit. And the after effects of this drug were so bad that we were all covered from head to toe in blisters. They would, they would wrap us up in bandages and they would lie us in baths full of ice trying to prevent our brains from frying. And um, unfortunately, long story short, um, within 90 days, 24 of the 25 of us that were on that drug had, had died. Um, the after effects were so bad, they burned us internally. Uh, I lost one of my lungs, uh, my liver and my kidney were destroyed, the muscles around my heart began to deteriorate. But, you know, I, I say I'm one of the lucky ones and I, I never say I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm still alive. I, I say I'm one of the lucky ones because it wasn't my mum. She had to go to death counselling once a week for the two hours to deal with what was going to happen to a little boy. Um, you know, she had to make the choice to inject a drug into a child that's killed every single person that ever taken it. And, you know, I hope, I hope and pray that I never have to make those decisions and those choices. And you know, I would not wish that sort of pain on, on my worst enemy. So my mum burnt me for another 18 months, hoping that one day I was allowed to go home. And um, just before my, I think it was just before my fifth birthday, the doctors came in and said. I don't know why they, it's funny, they, they take, and I'm sure you know about it, and anybody who's been in a hospital, they, they take the parent or the guardian uh, outside the curtains to tell them the bad news, but I've never heard of soundproof curtains, like every hospital I've ever been to, I can hear everything that gets said, right? So they take them outside, they say, your son, he will never go to school, he'll never play sport, he'll be a housebound baby, but um, if he reaches his teenage years, it'll be a miracle, but you can take your little boy home. I said to her as she came back through the curtains, I said, uh, what did the doctor say? And she looked at me in the face and said, uh, oh, son, the doctors told me that everything was gonna be okay. To go through what you've been through, to face the challenges that you face, and to be sat here with me right now with a smile on your face, almost almost telling me this in a kind of matter of, yeah, this happened to me and that happened to me, but guess what? Because of that, this happened to me and that happened to me and that happened to me. Do you think that comes from, oh, there's an element of nurture or nature in there? Do you think your mum's spirit and your mum's mindset, mentality and way of approaching life has, has filtered down to you and impacted on you in the same way? Yeah, no question. No question at all. And even looking back on hospital days, you know, <clears throat> I had to get up and go to the toilet even though I was burnt. Whereas everybody else just peed in a, in a tube. She made me do my homework at school she made me do schoolwork in hospital, whereas everybody else was really wrapped up in cotton wool. She made sure that I had a dream and a goal and a vision that was bigger and greater and more challenging than just to be a normal kid and a kid that gets to go home and make friends and go to school. I had to dream bigger and bigger and bigger to continually stretch and grow and challenge myself. So that's been embedded in me at such a young age and continued to be reinforced throughout my life. And, and then all of a sudden, in 2016 the roles were reversed and I had to be the rock and the strength and um, because it was the first time really in my life that I'd had the doctors tell me what was going on in my life as opposed to telling mum what was going on in my life so I had the choice to tell her what I wanted to tell her versus what the doctors have told me and that was a real full circle moment in my life. You know, in 2000, and, well, what was it, 1989, I was told I'd never go to school, sport, etc. And she said, everything will be okay. When I was 12, 
um, and I had my heart attack. She told me everything was going to be okay. And then in 2016, unfortunately, they found four more tumors in my throat. They told me that my tomorrows weren't guaranteed and that I really needed to slow down. And I, you know, as a, as a 32 year old man at that time in my life, I, I did a video message saying goodbye to my family. I, I prepared my own funeral. And um, I still remember the phone call. She, she called me when I was on my way home from the doctors and she said the exact words that I had said to her so many times in the past. What did the doctor say? And I got a chance to return the favor and use her words and say, oh, the doctors told me that everything was going to be okay. You went on to uh, write a book that became a bestseller. Tell, tell me about that journey. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a wild one. Here it is here. Um, the title, obviously, <clears throat> I've got to do with my uh, my story itself. But I guess uh, we had we had some some big things happen in our life. Uh, 2017, after being told that we will never uh, be able to have kids, we announced to the world after five years of IVF that we were going to have a baby. And um, that was amazing. Uh, we were due to have the baby the end of February 2018. Um, but on the 8th of December 2017, my wife had a lot of back pain. We went to hospital. She was 29 weeks pregnant. And um, we, uh, we were told that our baby was on its way. Uh, we were airlifted to Sydney. And um, four days later at 6.40 p.m. on the 12th of December, uh, my wife gave birth to a beautiful little a beautiful little boy uh, who was very, very unwell. He, um, he only weighed uh, just on two pound and he was taken away from us. He was put in intensive care, unit level three, where um, we, we couldn't be parents. We couldn't hold him or touch him. A month later, we were told that he was doing really well and they transferred us all back to our local hospital here in Coffs Harbour. And then the very next day, we got a phone call from the doctor telling us to go in and we went in and he um, he took me into one room and my wife went to our little boy and he sat me down and he told me that um, our little boy had a horrible illness called sepsis, a, um, a, a blood disease where um, uh, we were told we'd only have four days with him and we were getting airlifted back to Sydney Hospital and I remember I walked out of the room and my wife said to me, what did the doctor say? And um, at that point, it was just like this domino of what mum told me, what mum told me, what I told mum, and now I'm going to tell my wife. And I told her everything was going to be okay. And on the uh, on the plane flying back to Sydney, our little boy stopped breathing. And I remember, I remember just praying out the window saying hey man you you take 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 my house take my car take everything i've ever created everything i ever owned um, but please don't take my little boy and it's so sad that in the world we live in we have to wait until we get to that really dark point for us to begin to prioritize what's important and then um he he uh he started breathing on his own again and and then four days later, we captured his first little smile. And I think that was the day that we knew uh, truly that everything was going to be okay. And now he's, uh, he's three years old. He's healthy. He shits more than we could imagine. He, um, he eats more than we could imagine. And, um, you know, we, we love him. We love him more than we could ever imagine. <laughs> I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. Click over here if you want to see more episodes. Click over there if you want to subscribe, which I'd love you to do. Press the bell button. And every time we produce content, you're going to be the first one to see it. I'll see you on the next episode.